Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Clothes, 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 Music, 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 Boys, Boys, Boys by Viv Albertine. Dane reads. She was the guitarist in a band called The Slits. Uh, we'll get to what she did in her career really, but uh, I'm going to read you the blurb, but then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs. Uh, what I will say as well is this was actually given to me by a friend of mine, so shout out to Juliet from The Tired Dressmaker. She gave this to me because she thought I would enjoy it, and I did. Uh, and I'll be passing it on to a you know, some of our joint friends, to Dave and Amanda as well afterwards. So, let others who were there tell their versions if they want to. This is mine. In 1970, Viv Albertine knew she wanted to be in a band, but had never seen a woman play electric guitar. Seven years later, she was the guitarist in the hugely influential all-female punk band, The Slits. This is the story of how, through sheer will, talent and fearlessness, she forced herself onto a male-dominated music scene and became part of a movement that changed music. Everything is here, unvarnished and unwashed. Art school, squatting, hanging out in sex with Vivian Westwood and Malcolm McLaren, spending a day chained to Sid Vicious, on tour with The Clash, and being part of a brilliant pioneering group of women making musical history. The result is a raw, thrilling story of life on the frontiers, and a candid account of what happened post-punk, taking in a career in film, IBS, illness, divorce, and making music again 25 years later. This is a truly remarkable memoir told in Viv's frank, irreverent and distinctive voice. Shocking, very funny and ruthlessly honest, it is the story of a life lived unscripted, told from the heart. And so we're going to jump straight in to the start, chapter one. I'm going to read you the whole chapter here of chapter one. Quite a lot of short chapters here, they actually almost read as though they were all individual blog entries and got amalgamated into one book, you know, but... Right, chapter one, masturbation. Never did it. Never wanted to do it. There was no reason not to, no oppression. I wasn't told it was wrong and I don't think it's wrong, I just didn't think of it at all. I didn't actually want to do it, so I didn't know it existed. By the time my hormones kicked in, at about 13 years old, I was being felt up by boys and that was enough for me. Bit by bit the experimentation went further until I first had sex with my regular boyfriend when I was 15. We were together for three years and are still friends now, which I think is nice. In all the time since my first sexual experience, I haven't masturbated, although I did try once after being nagged by friends when I complained I was lonely. But to me, masturbating when lonely is like drinking alcohol when you're sad. It exacerbates the pain. It's not that I don't touch my breasts, they're much nicer now I've put on a little weight, or touch between my legs or smell my fingers, I do all that, I like doing that, tucked up all warm and cosy in bed at night, but it never leads on to masturbation, can't be bothered. I don't have fantasies much either, except once when I was pregnant and all hormoned up. I felt very aroused and had a violent fantasy about being fucked by a pack of rabid wild dogs in the front garden. I later miscarried, that'll teach me. This fantasy didn't make me want to masturbate. I ran the scenario through my head a couple of times, wrote it down and never had a thought like it again, honest. Please God let that old computer I wrote it on be smashed into a million pieces and not lying on its side in a landfill site somewhere, waiting to be dug up and analysed sometime in the future, like Lucy the Australopithecus fossil. Here we go then, genital warts and all. So I thought again this was interesting on the subject of like feminism and societal expectations towards women. There's another trait that adds to Ari's liberation. She doesn't care about being attractive to boys. She's not bothered about looking pretty or moving seductively for them. She only does that for her own pleasure. She doesn't see her body as a vehicle for attracting a mate, and she doesn't squash bits of her personality to avoid overshadowing boys. I realise I'm learning a lot from her, and it would be foolish of me to dismiss her because she's young. Since knowing Ari, I've become more aware of how uptight I am about my body, bodily functions, smells and nudity. Ari moves her body with the unselfconsciousness of a child, and I don't see any reason why I can't reclaim that feeling, even though I'm older. I'm constantly questioning stereotyping through my work, but I'm still enslaved by the stereotype of femininity in my mind. It's hard to fight an enemy who has outposts in your head, Sally Campton. Ari has no such hang-ups. When we played the music machine in Mornington Crescent, halfway through the set she was dying for a piss. She didn't want to leave the stage and couldn't bear to be uncomfortable, so she just pulled down her leggings and knickers and pissed on the stage, all over the next band's guitarist pedals as it happened. I was so impressed. No girl had pissed on stage before, but Ari didn't do it to be a rebel or to shock. It was much more subversive than that. She just needed a piss. In, the, in these times when girls are so uptight and secretive about their bodies and desperately trying to be feminine, she is a revolutionary. Then we get a reference to them meeting Chris Blackwell of Island Records, which I always find funny whenever I read about Chris Blackwell. He was mentioned in, a, in another book I read as well, but um, I have a friend called Chris Blackwell. 
who runs an open mic night, but not Island Records. They're talking about a cover of Heard It Through the Grapevine, and she says, out of respect to the original, we don't change the gender of the song. We can't stand it when people do that. Neither can I. I hate it, like, people do covers of, like, To Know Him Is To Love Him, and they'll sing To Know Her Is To Love Her, and it's just stupid, to be honest. Uh, we get this about uh, keeping time during music, which I'm not great at keeping time, so I thought this was funny. Recently, there's been no room for speeding up, slowing down, dropping a beat, turning the beat around, singing a bit out of tune. Everyone's desperately trying to be a good musician, quite the opposite of why we started a group in the first place. I find it difficult to keep time, but what kind of human being can keep in metronomic time? It doesn't seem natural to me. I don't understand why timekeeping is considered such an attribute in Western music. African drummers don't play one speed all the way through a piece of music. They speed up and slow down according to the mood. Same with Indian music. It's like being told to keep the same speed and rhythm all through sex. And I like this starts off with a quote by Lord Byron. That awful yawn which sleep cannot abate. And this was great too. Uh, she went off to study at college and she says, Whenever I get a free period, I set off to the college library and work systematically through the Dewey system, taking each book off the shelf one by one and adding, in Black Biro, she and woman to every he and man. I do this for the whole three years, but I never finish, and luckily I never get caught. I do it with righteous indignation. There is hardly one book in the whole library that doesn't use only the generic male pronoun, as if only men think and feel and discover and read. We've been taught on this course that every single mark and sound on film or the page is important and laden with meaning, and yet every book in this library talks only to men. Language is important, it shapes minds, it can include, exclude, incite, hurt and destroy. If language isn't powerful, why not call your teacher a cunt? We get a reference to Two C's and a K, which was something I read in a Stephen King book recently as well. I'm just going to read the paragraph out here. I had some good jobs. First I worked as a freelance sound assistant on commercials. Most of the setups are the same. What's turned in the industry, two C's and a K, two cunts in a kitchen. But I earn good money. Next I'm given my own office at 01 for London, a listings magazine on TV. I nearly ran out into the main office and said to the producer, no, no, there must be some mistake. And worked with a great team of people there, intelligent, fun. The office was in Denmark Street, right in the middle of Soho. I had to think on my feet and improvise, guerrilla filmmaking, four or five locations a day, in and out of a van with a small crew, meeting interesting people. Anthony Burgess, Roald Dahl, Spike Milligan. Up and coming bands like the Cranberries, the Black Crows and the Black Eyed Peas. It's interesting again, I've been reading Spike Milligan recently. In fact, I've read all of those authors. And so this is a chapter uh, called How Hastings Housewife Rebels. Or maybe it's Hastings Housewife Rebels, I don't know. <laughs> but she's talking about, yeah, her time as a housewife and she had quite a controlling, possessive husband. I promised myself I would do two things when we moved to the coast. One, I would do a class at art college. Two, I would get fit. I signed up for a ceramics course one afternoon a week at Hastings Art School. My husband is annoyed. I don't understand why. Perhaps he's jealous. I register him for a life drawing class so I'm not the only one having fun. I choose ceramics because it fits in with my daughter's school timetable and since the cancer treatment my hands are so shaky I probably can't draw or paint anymore. This is the first time I haven't agonised over a decision. The other people on the course are a mixture of old and young, unemployed, part-timers and loners like me. I love them. They're clever and interesting. I love their conversations. They discuss hearing aids in the war. Women used to put a box of Omo washing powder in the window to signal to the American GIs, old man out. They make me laugh. Coming to this class once a week is healing. I feel relaxed and comfortable for the first time in a decade. Best of all is the teacher, Tony Bennett. When the student is ready, the teacher appears. A good teacher is a gift. They bring a subject alive and that's what Tony does for me. He watches me for a couple of months like I'm a nervous animal. He doesn't get too close. Occasionally he appears behind me, the way art teachers do, and makes a comment about my interpretation of a subject. He never criticises, never picks at my technique, always talks about the emotion in the work until one day, when we become relaxed with each other, he says gently, Viv, why don't you try expressing yourself in your work? We get a reference to the band Straight 8, which I assume is not the same band Straight 8 that I interviewed for my radio show. There are a few bands called Straight 8, so. She uh, says as well, then I go to the doctors and get antidepressants. I don't do this lightly. I've always been prone to depression. I'm melancholic. I've fought it all my life. Last year it occurred to me to ask my mother, Mum, does everyone have a knot of pain and anxiety in their chest every day from the moment they wake up in the morning until they go to bed at night like I do? She looked worried and said no. I mean I do. She says uh, her father was taken to hospital and she missed Neil Young at Hop Farm Festival. Uh, this was actually the, the year before I went, so I saw Bob Dylan the year after, but I would have loved to have seen Neil Young. Let me get this line, uh, somebody says, oh you don't drink and you don't take drugs. Yeah great, you'll die a beautiful corpse but you'll be lonely and you'll never meet a guy. Only queers don't drink. I don't drink and I wouldn't identify as queer, although I get called it occasionally. On YouTube sometimes. On one video I got called, what was it I got called? Uh, it was like something like stupid cis person and homo 
on the same video on the same day by two different people and I'm like, make your mind up. He says this, the French love their dogs. I'm always suspicious of people who adore animals. They often don't care much for humans. I love animals and don't care for much for humans, but hey ho. So yeah, close, 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 music, 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 boys, boys, boys by Viv Albertine. I think I would have enjoyed it a little bit more if I'd like known the slits and was familiar with their music or was familiar with her. But I still did enjoy it, uh, mainly because I knew a lot of the people that she talked about in the book. Overall, I'd probably give it a 4 out of 5, and it's a pretty solid sort of rock and roll music memoir. So if that's your sort of thing, check it out. So there you go, that's what I made of Close, 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 Music, 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 Boys, Boys, Boys by Viv Albertine. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book, and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.